Good evening, and again, I bring you greetings in the precious name of Jesus Christ, my Lord, and give thanks unto him that I have an opportunity here just now that I might indeed declare his word, set forth the glorious gospel of Christ Jesus, our Lord, and in every way seek to honor our God and to do so in the trinity of his persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and it is ever our desire that it would be at most in our hearts and mind that salvation is of the Lord. And therefore he saved us unto himself. And the this is a Trinitarian work of salvation. It is God the Father that decreed, God the Son that obtained, and God the Holy Spirit that makes it uh, be brought to life and to be made effectual in lives and in hearts. And it is to this that we have recently given some interest. Uh, I just read something the other day concerning the Spirit of God that there's a tendency for us to just simply go along and reading about the Father, reading about the Son, and failing to be aware of the fact that it's the Holy Spirit that brings these things to us as matters of truth and life and causes them to live within us. And thus we are to be aware of his person. He does not speak of himself. Christ said he wouldn't. He's going to tell you about, about Christ. And this is exactly what he does. But we cannot lose sight of the fact that he is, while referred to as the third person of the Godhead, he is God, the Holy Spirit. And we would thus be led to think in those directions. Now, I do, as I say, I bring greetings to you in the name of Christ and praying that he, the Holy Spirit, would empower and enable those things which we would say here just now and that he would make it effectual, not only in the heart of this poor preacher, but in your hearts as well. I do um, pray for each of you, and a, it is my desire uh, that the fact, well, John, in one of his epistles, he said he rejoiced in the knowledge that his children walk in truth. And this, of course, is my desire first and foremost for you. Obviously, I pray for your health, I pray for your comfort, I pray for your consolation, and I do so because that's what my Lord did for me. And I would urge you that you do the same one for another. And I love the thoughts of Paul as he brings the book of Ephesians to a close as he exhorts them in the matter of prayer and then says, and for me also. And it was that he might have utterance, that he might have something to say, and that he might be made effectual in the ministry of the Word of God. So I do ask that you would pray for me in that regard, that you would look to the Lord and intercede in my behalf. It is ever my desire to serve him first and to do so by serving you. He who will be great among you, let him serve. And this is, I just read that in my devotionals this morning, and uh, it's, it's ever a reinforcement to me that the highest place of honor in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ is one of service. And even then, we do not understand. I'm asking, what is it I'm doing? I'm, I'm nothing. I can't do anything. And you know what? If indeed I am his servant, I do not want to know what it is that I am doing. I might just want to brag a little bit, or I might want to just have some feel-good moments about myself. And I want my rejoicing to be in Christ, and I want the same thing for you. And so we would invoke the favor of God just now as we would look into his word. So pray with me. Father, I thank you for this time. Thank you for this privilege. I thank you for your word. Thank you for this to which we will look asking, O oh Lord, for the guidance of he, the Holy Spirit, of whom we will speak, and that it might redound to thine honor and glory through the exalting of Jesus Christ our Lord. I pray for all my church families, and Lord, especially do I pray wherein there is grief and suffering just now because of the illnesses of the flesh, because of losses, 
And, O oh Lord, I pray that you would manifest your mercy there too. Go with us now, I ask, in Jesus' name and for his sake. He alone is worthy. And amen. I want to return just now to the book of Romans once more, the eighth chapter, and sort of pick up where I left off in the last message, but uh, time will not permit me to actually rehearse much about that other than the fact to, to observe that this chapter begins, and we talked about the fact of it being the chapter that begins with no condemnation and ends with no separation. And But the fact is that for that there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus and with this statement who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit and thus this is a continuation we delivered a message some time back on walking in the spirit and so this then becomes an extension and the extension is to be understood in this way, that ours is a spiritual life. And this is what Paul is talking about in the early parts of this chapter, when he talks about the carnal mind, and to be carnally minded is, the carnal mind is enmity against God, not subject to the law of God. And so they that are in the flesh, that is, some, uh, serving earthly purposes, looking to their own nature, following the guidance of the old nature, and not looking, as it were, to be led by the Spirit of God, that they, they just simply cannot please God. But, he said, and this is, again, that but that we love to see, you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. And this we must understand, that it is the Holy Spirit that indwells us, bringing the indwelling of Christ to a reality within us as well. Understanding of Christ, it was said, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. And so, the, with this statement as well, the contrast. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. I say this to begin with, I say it often, you must be born again. You, there must be new life. You do not do spiritual deeds. You do not exercise spiritual gifts. And among those gifts are repentance, faith, that trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, there of His grace. You didn't make it up. You didn't cause it to happen. You didn't will it. It was something that He did. And so we simply fall upon His mercy. And we would preach this message to all with that commandment that has gone out to all, repent ye and believe the gospel. And so, and if Christ be in you, and I love this thought, verse 11 was where we left off in the last message, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Paul just keeps, he's redundant about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to begin the text this evening with verse 12. And I've got much to cover. If I don't cover it, we'll pick it up in a later message. But the fact is that he begins here, and hear ye the word of the Lord, Therefore, brethren, uh, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I think that is one of the most critical verses as far as our identity in Christ is concerned. For as many, verse 14 of Romans 8, memorize it. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And there we might pray, O Holy Spirit, lead me. For you have not, verse 15, received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. 
the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And may God bless the reading of his word. I'm going to go ahead and read verse 18 where he said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now then, with the desire that God bless the reading of his word, we would continue thus to expound something on the word of God. Again, I've already mentioned this redundancy and reinforcement as Paul continues with transition to another aspect of our relationship with Christ through the Spirit. He would have us to understand the ongoing ministry of the Spirit bringing assurance to the hearts of the children of God. When you say, oh, I know I'm saved. How do you know that? Are you led of the Spirit? Are you conscious of His leadings? Are you sensitive to the things that the Spirit communicates? Are the fruits of the Spirit in evidence in your life? And I can't help but bring those challenges out because there is so much presumption, and presumption frightens me. It frightens me for the person who is presuming because just the statement, I know I'm saved, does not guarantee your salvation. What does guarantee your salvation is this manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the works of righteousness, the love of righteousness in you, and this and this alone is the means whereby we may be assured that we are His. And he's already said it that if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And so it doesn't make any difference about your little profession way back when. What does make a difference is your life as it is continued on and as it does continue on now. And so this, this chapter continues to be centered on the Holy Spirit and that function in bringing the things of Christ to us and causing them to be manifest in us. The question of airship here is introduced and explained along with the fact that it is ours as a result of that miraculous work of adoption, and we'll comment somewhat on that, and that special identity with Christ that we have as a result thereof. We are co-heirs with Christ. We are identified with him as sons. It is important then that we understand the aim of God in glorifying us together with Christ, and that requires sonship that is proclaimed and experienced. To say, my Father, and how many have prayed, our Father, which art in heaven, and have no real sense of the fatherhood of God in their life, that they belong to him, that they are subject to him, and that they are his dear children, and that he will be a father indeed to them, and that there will be interaction. Being the children of God is a matter of fact and experience. So we must be led of the Spirit as a matter of the divine purpose. And or there is no identity with God. And especially we're not sons. Oh my. And so in those first three verses that I read to you, in verses 12 through 14, there the children of God are identified. How do you know that you're a child of God? How do I know someone else is a child of God? I can often, I've often made the statement, I'll continue to make the statement, I have no way of truly knowing. We go based on evidence. You shall know them, our Lord taught his disciples, by their fruits. We were warned to beware of wolves in sheep's clothing, putting on an outward nature. But the fruits of righteousness, there's no counterfeit for them. There are outward displays. There are fleshly displays. There are pretensions to righteousness. But you'll know true righteousness as the righteousness of Christ, and you'll know it when you see it. And by their fruits, you shall know them. 
a good tree cannot bring forth bad fruit and vice versa. And so the words of verse 12 suggest that we are debtors. And what Paul used that term early on. He was debtors both to the Jews and to the Greeks in chapter 1 of this book. But when he said we are debtors, he said it in order to make a contrast, not to the flesh. We owe the flesh nothing. We have no allegiance thereto. And I know that some try to rationalize various fleshly behaviors and, as far as that's concerned, various fleshly affections and various fleshly allegiances. But we owe the flesh absolutely nothing. And we're not, we're not debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh, to be submitting to those things. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. That's, that's just it. The end result of that, a continuation, if that is the way of life, all the religion in the world won't change it. And so, but if through the Spirit you do mortify the deeds of the flesh. What's that word mean, mortify? It means you put it to death, that we are mortal, human, we're, we're subject to death. What does it mean to mortify the deeds of the flesh? Put them to death. Don't succumb to them. Don't obey the, the, the desires. Don't be led by them. Don't have it suggested to you that it's okay to do this and you don't have to worry about that. None of these things need we give heed to because our leadership is to be discovered through the Spirit of God as being the Spirit of God and it will always be in conjunction with the Word of God. And so, if for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So, the, the consequences of living after the flesh are well known. It's the way of death, and it's the way of the world. An ultimate destruction, and it has no part with the children of God. In the believer, such a way, as I've already said, is to be put to death. And not that we should destroy our bodies. He's not telling us to do that. I think I'll go kill myself then. No. That we are dealing with these things in a spiritual plane. We put we subject them to ourselves. Paul said, I keep under my body. And that, that situation, he lamented the fact that he often was dealing with these fleshly issues. And all of us have them. But to be led by the Spirit of God is to be declared to be the sons or the children of God. And it's under a conscious and continuous, and here's what it is to be led by the Spirit of God. It is to be under a conscious and a continuous constraint to love the Lord and to please Him. It's continuous. It's, it's ongoing. It is something that we do. It is something that we must do. It is something that we are subject to. And the fact is that it, we are led in the sense of being made. That is, we're directed, we're commanded. There is no question about it. But I love the fact that the commandments of the Lord, number one, are not grievous. In other words, they're not going to be something that cause you uh, anguish or they cause you pain, they cause you suffering. It's not going to be that. But on the other hand, we likewise are enabled by the grace of God to see the truth and to love righteousness. It's not just a matter of I ought to do. It is what I desire to do. Why do I do that? Because that's the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That's what we want to see in our lives. That is evidence of who we are and of our identity as the children of God. Not only to love righteousness, but to pursue holiness in our hearts, purity of heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And this is the desire that we ever be in that way. And in our lives, not only in that which we experience within ourselves, but that which is witnessed by others. It is my desire 
my mother used to impress upon me the fact, and it had its impact, even when I was just an unsaved brat running around with no sense of direction, but somehow or another that would come back. Do you understand that what you do out in the community reflects on your dad and me as your parents? I didn't like that, didn't want to be put under that pressure, but it had its effect. How much more so would I not want to bring dishonor and disrespect to my Heavenly Father and to my Lord Jesus Christ? And this the leadership of the Holy Spirit provides. We are sons, not so high as Christ, nor so low as Adam, or even in the sense of the angels. We are the redeemed of the Lord. And so, how do I know? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, he comes to an interesting thought here. And again, the special emphasis here in our last message, it was life in Christ. Here is our identity as being the child of God. Here is a, a true assurance. Here is our uh, knowing that we are the child of God. And here he says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. And we have talked about that before, and especially that uh, the writer of Hebrews spoke of those through whom all their lifetime were in bondage through the fear of death. It is to these that Christ has come and has delivered us. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, real Father. There is an identity and there is a mystery in this word, and they'll give, well, you can get definitions for it, real, true Father. And it's a, it's a term that apparently was understood. But in the context that we have it here, that we are, it, it is something that is spiritually uttered, spiritually sensed, spiritually trusted, spiritually acted upon, that it takes on a very special connotation. And we would not lose sight of that. And so whereby we cry, Abba, Father, now, fear is considered as a spiritual matter, and I quoted to you from Hebrews 2.15. The fear of death, it, it has an enslaving effect. You know, people go through this life, I'm not worried, I'll take this, no, well, I'm not, I'm not afraid, whatever. But you know what? There is something that always looms large in the minds of all. They look about them. I've often made the statement that every funeral is a brush with eternity. It's not original with me, but I like to use it because even that unsaved person sit there and he's looking, he say, hey, one of these days, that's me. And then what? And he doesn't know. And the fear of the unknown will keep one in bondage. But in any event, they know there's no do-overs. You don't get another chance at this. And, and that's not how things work. But we would first mention adoption before the spirit of adoption. It is not a work of grace done within us, although there is something that attends it. And the, the, it's, it's something, it's a work of grace done from without us. That is, it's God's doing, and we're passive in this. He has adopted us as sons. He has adopted us as his children. He has put us on a legal standing right alongside the Lord Jesus Christ as who we are. And he cannot deny himself. And, and we love that thought. I understand adoption is that which takes place with regeneration, with the new birth. And so we're not going to sell any aspect of this short. It's essentially a legal term, but it's made more special in the light of the ministry of the Holy Spirit here. And in this, we truly understand some things. Thus, he is called the spirit of adoption. And there are many names of God that depict what he does in redemption. And here it is with the spirit. The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God. 
and we uh, we understand many terms. He's the breath of God. There are uh, many aspects of this. Here he's called the spirit of adoption. What is that referring to? It's that which he does in connection with the grace of God adopting us as his children. And here's what happens. And because ye are sons, and we see it in the text here, but we also see it in Galatians 4, 6, because your sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son. Here, the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of his son. Here in, the, in Romans, he's the spirit of adoption. Same thing, but he is crying, Abba, Father. In other words, that which is within us that enables us to sense, to know truly that God is my father. You know, this is one of those things that we have witnessed. I never questioned Growing up with that man that was in my house who did certain things for me, who expressed his love toward me and did all these things, I just knew that was my daddy. And that part has never changed. Yet, when I was brought to know the Lord Jesus Christ in the pardon and forgiveness of sins, I found out who my real father was, who my true father was. And I am able to think he has constituted me as a son. He's made me to think as a son, as a true member of the family, as one with the commonwealth of Israel, as the term is used in Ephesians 2. And there we are understanding that we are the family of God. We are made to be so, and that constitution comes from the Spirit. So it embraces, that word Abba Father embraces the highest form of esteem and acknowledgement and reflects the loving submission of God's children. It's the term used by our Lord in his most desperate hour. Now then, the dual witness to sonship, as we understand it here. If children, and again, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so we're brought in the Spirit. We're brought in that regenerated form. We're brought with that new knowledge, being made a new creature in Christ. And the Spirit within us bears witness with our spirit. There is union, communion, identity, and all of these things that persuades us that we are the sons of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him. That is, we're divorced from the world. We're separated from the world. These earthly deeds, they're dead unto us. And we, we are looking rather to this full identity with him. And so the question of a doubt may arise in the concerns even of true believers. And that, and, but God has fixed it up so that we need assurance as a matter of faith being exercised. In other words, why do I doubt? Why do I ever question? Well, it's good for you. It's good for you because then you're brought back to the way of faith. You're not looking for proof. You look for that which faith delivers to us, which is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, the reality of Jesus Christ, beholding the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. How do we do that? Through faith. And thus, in the exercise of faith, we are strengthened and we are brought the more into that identity with him. And so here we are told how that is given to us. It's the Holy Spirit bearing witness with our spirit. This is that regenerated spirit, that new creature in Christ Jesus and the spirit of God then being fully compatible with that and so doing, dealing with us in that way. By faith, that, this is that which is responsive to the promptings of the Spirit who is ever directing us to Christ and revealing the things in Christ in us. So involved is he that hope maketh not ashamed because, and listen, of the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Not only ch children, but heirs and joint heirs with Christ. In the, the, the relationship of Christ to his brethren, as such, we not only receive him, but all that pertains to him. And so we share 
in the kingdom and glory with him. It's an ownership that cannot be divided. It can't be broken up into multiple heirs. Searching out, and this the prophets were looking for, what and of what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Thus we suffer with him in full identity with him. Oh, indeed, that you may have that assurance, that you may be able to determine that for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. May the Lord bless you richly is my prayer.